Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, the Soul Power People Solar MOOC. Um, tonight we have uh, Janet Hughes, and she's going to be talking about uh, JTA, uh, NAPSAP JTA topic domain, um, installing electrical components. Uh, really excited to have Janet here. She's a uh, uh, Ontilities lead solar consultant and subject matter expert. She teaches many of Ontilities advanced solar training courses. She's a community leader, businesswoman, educator, consultant, and a pioneer in the solar industry. Her career spans 30 years of electrical and business experience. She's a licensed master electrician and has trained solar energy installers for electrical and solar contracting companies since 1997. She's got a lot of experience, and with that, I will turn it over to Janet. Thanks, Richard. Hello, everybody, and um, thanks for joining us. Um, let's see, get over here. So we're going to be talking about um, you know, all the electrical components in a, an in array uh, system, PV system, including the array and all the conduit and wire, overcurrent protection, everything that makes up a, a complete electrical system for a PV array. And so some of the things that make a code compliant system is you've got to make sure that the array matches the plans that you originally presented to the permitting authority, the authority having jurisdiction. A lot of times when we do installs, things change at the last minute. We have to do things slightly different because maybe those modules aren't available that we thought were going to be available and we have to change gears. Um, so you just always have to make sure that you redo your plans, you redo your drawings, and, and get those um, submitted uh, before inspection. The array conductors, conduit, over overcurrent protection devices, they all have to be sized and rated uh, correctly. Um, and uh, we also have to make sure that all the connections that we use everywhere from attaching the, the modules to the racking system to you know get, uh, going into junction boxes, combiner boxes, the disconnects. You know, everything has to be rated for the environment to make sure that it can withstand the environment that's being exposed to. We also have to make sure that all uh, wire management is complete. You know, we have to make sure that um, we have uh, proper, all the wires are tucked up underneath the array that they're not hanging down, you know, to be tripped on, you know, uh, they're not hanging down so that they can scrape the roof if you're on a roof. Uh, you, you can use wire uh, trays, you can use, um, you know, different types of uh, gutter systems, you know, uh, racking that has, you know, you know, wire trays that are attached to it. There's a lot of different ways that you can actually manage this, the wire that is run. You also have to make sure that the conduit is run properly and that, you know, it, uh, you know, that the wires are grouped properly in junction boxes and combiner boxes. All of this has to do with wire management. Um, you have to make sure that the electrical enclosures are also located where they're supposed to be by code and sized correctly. There has to be proper labeling on everything, which we'll discuss a complete grounding system, and then also correct interconnection to the utility. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on interconnection to the utility because that's going to be handled in another session, um, so we'll stop at grounding. So one of the first things that we're seeing in the uh, 2011 code is some new language here on what is a qualified person. Um, this is definitely um, the first time that this has ever happened in the code where they've been this specific about um, what makes a qualified person, and they specifically mention PV equipment and systems. So a qualified person has to have specific skills, you know, and specific training related to the work that they're being done, and that has to include safety training. And you'll notice that, you know, NAPSEP now is requiring that everybody get um, OSHA 10 hour. Well, you know, this is uh, as a result of some of the new code requirements that are out there as well. Plus, it doesn't hurt to have that kind of uh, safety training at all. So um, on uh, sizing and wire uh, selection, 
basically Mike Holt talked a lot about this in his presentation, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here. However, um, I do want to reference some of the code sections where it talks about single conductor cable 690.31B, where it talks about you have to use USE2 or PV wire. Um, that's the standard wire that we typically see in um, PV systems. And make a special note of uh, 690.31B, um, which says that um, um, basically the PV wire is not in the charts in the code. It is not, you're not going to find sizes for it in charts in the code because it changes depending on what the manufacturer specs are. So you have to check with manufacturer specs to get the right diameter when you're doing all your calculations for conduit fill. Um, make sure you note that. And then, of course, we have to derate uh, all this wire for temperature for rooftop installations, and re temp temperature for the site, the specific site. And again, 310.15B3C. Um, so note all of that and make sure you do that. And, and also, you have to make sure that your your string sizing is done properly, that you get the right voltages within the specs of the inverter. And you also have to make sure that your wire is rated properly for wet conditions. You know that you always have to use wet rated wire in conduit. Um, you have to use something like THWN, the W standing for the wet rating, instead of THHN. And what we're finding a lot out there in the field now is that the, rate, the wire is double rated. So you, if you get a THHN wire, it's also going to be rated for THWN, so it's, it's, um, it's helped this issue. This is kind of an interesting um, slide here. Um, you notice this burned box. Um, this was actually a system that had 24 modules in a source circuit, and this is what happened to the box. If you take like a typical module or, you know, like a shot 235 module, okay, the open circuit voltage is 37.1. If you multiply that by 24 and then also say if you're in a location that has minus 19 degrees Celsius for your, your coldest temperature, that actually is 1,020 volts DC that ran through that system. And all of our wires, what are they rated for? 600 volts. So um, you, you basically have um, these kinds of things happening out in the field sometimes. It's very important to string properly. Here's another wire management issue. Um, not only you can see that there's possible nicks that could happen on this wire, but this wire is not rated properly. It's not the proper PV wire or USC2 wire. Um, probably looks like it was just regular THHN or something like that that was, that was used here. The other thing that you have to make sure you do is group properly. This is in the code. This is a new addition to the code as well, 690.4B. Um, all wires have to be labeled and identified, um, and they have to be labeled and identified as they're going into um, uh, conductors have to be grouped as they're going into junction boxes and into combiner boxes and then labeled inside the boxes. If they are coming in from different arrays, this is where you have to pay attention to this closely. If, if basically you have two different systems sharing a box or a raceway. Um, the exception to this is, is when you, if you have conduits coming into a junction box or a combiner box, um, that's specific to each system, you know, then um, the labeling um, isn't required um, because you can actually see the groups of wires easily. If anybody has any questions at any point, please, you know, uh, chat them in. I would love to have you guys. I would like to um, actually, you know, unmute you from time to time so that um, you can actually, we can have some discussions on this. If anybody has anything that they want to say, you know, please uh, chat it in that you'd like to talk. Okay, this is a, an example of a, a of a combiner box where they have, um, you know, basically handled the wiring pretty well inside so that you can tell what's what. 
Here's another good management system where you have trays going all the way around. Um, and uh, you can see the open tray there on the right that will eventually will have a, a cover on it so that all the wires are, are grouped nicely together. Other management, wire management issues, you have to make sure that conductor ties are not too loose or too tight. You have to make sure you use the right type of UV rated wires, uh, ties, not the white ones, but the black ones. You have to make sure that your wires are not bent too sharply, that they're, they're the proper radius, and there are actually charts in the code book that tell you what kind of radius, radius you're supposed to use. Um, make sure that you don't have any loose connections because those will have, you know, put potential arcing and can be a fire hazard. Um, so um, whenever you have wires coming in through a fitting, you have to make sure that that, that fitting is actually, if you have multiple wires coming in, you have to make sure that it actually has separate holes in the fitting um, for the individual wires. And you have to make sure that you have expansion joints um, in the systems. Here's a, an example of a, a loose connector. Basically, somebody just put their hand down there, and the wire just kind of slipped out of the connector. Um, and you also can see that, that fitting on the right there where you've got um, a loose connector there as well. And you've seen these pictures before, but the Bakersfield fire, um, the target fire in Bakersfield, um, this was actually caused by an expansion joint not being there and not being in place properly. Um, so uh, always make sure that you have uh, expansion joints as they're needed. The code section for this is uh, NEC 300.7B. And you need to uh, pay close attention to the informational note here. Um, basically, um, what it says here is that um, you've got a reading for PVC conduit in the, in the table, 352.44. And then if you have steel conduit, you have to multiply that table by 0 0.20. If you have EMT conduit, you have to multiply it by 0 0.40. And I kind of expect that there's probably going to be some kind of a question about expansion joints in this test because it's been such, this, this fire has been such an issue in the industry that um, you're likely to see something. So again, proper selection for environmental conditions. This includes not just the wire, but it also includes you know, all your connectors, your junction boxes have to be rated properly, NEMA 3R or 4X, and make sure that if you're using a 3R box, you don't lay it down flat. Those boxes are meant to be um, mounted upright in a vertical position. The same with disconnects. Um, so make sure that you have the proper rating if you're going to have a, a, a box up on a rooftop. Here um, is a picture of where somebody's just gone into this little combiner box or this little junction box without a connector. Here's a situation where uh, it was actually laid flat on the roof rather than a vertical position. Um, that's definitely a situation where, um, you know, water can be, uh, get, you know, can get into that box. Um, you have to follow the manufacturer's specifications for how boxes are to be mounted and mount them vertically if that's what they're designed to do. Here's a NEMA 4X box that's mounted properly. This, this can be placed you know, flat on a roof. The wires, uh, the box is labeled. The wires are you know, run through the a little wireway, little cable tray there, and um, come into the box properly. Disconnects. OK, so um, you have to make sure that disconnects are located where they're supposed to be located and that you have them um, you know, in proper locations. Um, they have to be, um, you basically you have to have them in sight or within 50 feet of what you're disconnecting. And you have to make sure that um, you have a directory um, in place 
if the disconnect is more than six feet away, Okay, I have a question here from Sarah. How do you know if the wire ties are too tight on the cables? Is this a matter of common sense? How will this be inspected? Well, you know, when you it is kind of a matter of common sense. Um, but when you when you pull something too tight, you know what you're going to do is you're going to make an indentation in that wire. You're going to you're going to actually you know see, you know that um, it's being pulled too tightly. Um, so you just want it snug. Um, does that you know, kind of answer your question, Sarah? I should actually unmute you. Sarah, you can talk. Hello, Sarah. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Thanks. All right. <laughs> okay. So roof enclosures. Um, roof enclosures. Basically, all junction boxes, pull boxes, um, outlet bo basically boxes can be put behind modules, this is what this is said, they've actually said this in the code now where it's very, very clear. You can put a junction box or a combiner like underneath the array, underneath a module because you can actually take that module up to get access to it. So it's actually considered accessible in that situation. Okay, here's a proper conduit mounting um, where you can see that the conduit is mounted up off the roof. And um, you, that, the one on the right is a quick mount where you've got a shingled roof. You can use the flashings actually as mounts for your conduit to get them up off the roof. Circuit rout routing, here's a new section that uh, is in the code, and um, I'm going to actually move these back over here, these little boxes, so I can see all the slides. Sometimes it's a little bit, yeah, this is good. I can just check every once in a while if you guys are putting in comments or questions. Um, anyway, circuit routing um, is a new section in the code where it's talking about, this is really for fire safety where it's talking about um, you have to put your conduit inside or outside of the building. It's best to put it at where it's over structural members, uh, where it's over rafters or where it's over trusses. Um, if it's inside the building, it needs to be put underneath the structural members. And this is so if a firefighter is going, um, coming um, onto a roof with a fire in pro going on, they can actually vent close to the ridge. They like to vent close to the ridge. And so if you've got your conduit running up as close to the ridge as you can um, get it, then they have room to do their chainsaw work and actually vent the building. You can also put them um, you know, down in valleys or um, hips um, and then make straight lines um, of runs for your conduit to the array from there. You want to think about running your conduit so that it's um, out of the way of possible venting. That's what the whole purpose of this is. Um, and then also, of course, um, you know, having things either run really close to the array so that it's not a trip hazard is also something to think about as well. Okay. All right, so a new um, a, a new thing added to the code as well this year in 2000, for 2011 was uh, that we can use metal clad MC cable now um, in buildings. When you're running uh, circuits through a building, um, you can, uh, as long as it has a ground, all, pretty much all of them, uh, all that conduit has uh, a ground in there as well, but um, that's now allowed makes it a little bit easier, it's flexible, easier to run um, through a building. 
And that's uh, you can find that in, in NEC 250.11810. Okay, so summary of uh, conduit and wire management. Um, you want to make sure that the conductors are um, rated for the environmental conditions of the site and where you're installing them. You also have to make sure that they're not damaged in any way, rubbing against the roof surface or running, rubbing against any sharp objects. Um, also, uh, you want to make sure that conductors aren't a trip hazard. You want to make sure that they're supported within 12 inches of a box and, you know, within every three feet um, along the way. You want to make sure that all the conductors are grouped properly and that they're routed along structural members. For conduit, you want to make sure that they're supported at the proper intervals with, you know, within so many inches of a box. And this all depends on the type of conduit that you're using, and they're, you know, basically you need to go to those conduit sections in the code book to see what the, what the proper um, distance is. You know, for EMT, it's 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 within 12 inches of the box, or th or actually actually um, in some cases it is, or or and then every 10 feet um, is typical. Um, and then again, route along structural members. And you want to make sure that the conduit is mounted off the roof surface for um, the purpose of cooling. And recommended at least 0.75 inches is recommended, but typically when you're using a racking system, you know, we do more than that, and that certainly doesn't hurt. Marking and labeling. This is another big section um, that is in the code now. They've added to this section uh, quite significantly. Now all you know, raceways and, um, you know, junction boxes and closures of all kinds have to be labeled. And they have to be labeled with the wording photovoltaic power source. They have to be visible. They have to be rated for the environment so that they will last. And they also have to be um, labeled, if it's a piece of conduit or a raceway, you have to label it every 10 feet. Um, and you have to make sure that it's visible so that you can see it clearly. Um, and this has to be done inside and outside of buildings. Um, so if you're inside a building and you're doing this, then in every you don't have to worry about running a, um, having labels in conduit going down wall spaces, but you you do have to put them in each section if of the of the attic or if it's running through a particular area. Um, and there's wall partitions or ceilings or floors, make sure that it's labeled on both sides. So in selecting your signs, you need to make sure that, um, you know, they, they can be metal or plastic, but they can be engraved, machine printed, or electrophoto plating. They have to be contrasting colors. You've got to make sure that um, they're very visible and, and very readable. These are common signs that we see out there. The ones on the right, these stickers are, are great for, um, you know, putting on your conduit and raceways. DC disconnect labeling. You want to make sure you've got it labeled with operating current. IMP, your operating voltage, VMP. Um, what your maximum system voltage is, and this has to be. Um, you have to make sure that it's adjusted for temperature when you when we put the voltage on there, and also IMAX, which IMAX being, again, that it's, it's adjusted for the irradiance, the 125% times your current short circuit. That's your IMAX. This is correct labeling. Um, your AC disconnects also have to have labels. They have to say, warning, electric shock hazard, do not touch terminals. Terminals on both the line and load side may be energized in the open position. All right, so let's talk about grounding. This was something that Mike Holt didn't have time to talk about in the last um, session when he did it, so I want to I wanna spend a little bit of time on this so that, you know, um, proper grounding is extremely important and is definitely something that you're going to see on the test. So 
the equipment grounding conductor basically has has to be run so that you know all exposed non current carrying metal parts of module frames equipment and conductor enclosures shall be grounded regardless of voltage so what this means is that you basically have to to either have um, ground lugs attached to every frame of the module uh, of of your modules and then um, you also have to you have have to ground wire that would run from lug to lug on all the frames and then attach to the railing, the racking, um, so that your module frames are bonded to the metal parts of the racking system and then carried on to junction boxes or combiner boxes um, and then um, carried on to your inverter, to disconnects to your inverter and then on to your AC side. Um, where you're um, interconnecting with a grid. That equipment grounding conductor has to run through the complete system. Um, you know, sometimes we can use, um, depending on the jurisdiction, um, weebs will be allowed so that you can use these weeb clips to go underneath your mid clamps to bond the frames of the modules to the racking and to the rails. Um, or, and then the, the weeb land lugs can be used either on the module frames themselves if you're going to be running ground wire, um, and uh, they can also be used on the rails. And there's different clips, you know, depending on the different type of racking systems that you're using, you have to make sure the weeb clips um, are made for that particular system. <clears throat> So sizing the grounding conductor, the electric, the equipment grounding conductor. If there is no ground fault protection, then you need to size that equipment grounding conductor for 125% of the originated short circuit currents. So that is something that you know most inverters have ground fault protection, and so that we have that in our system. But you need to be um, aware of that in case. Um, you don't have it for some reason. And then also, um, if you do have ground fault protection, then you use table NEC 250.122 to size that um, ground wire. Now, um, typically we use number six um, when we're bonding the frames of the modules to the rails because number six is the smallest size solid bare copper wire that's allowed to be run without being protected from physical damage. Um, some jurisdictions will allow you to do number eight um, because they think if, if you're up on a roof that it's likely that that wire will not be subject to damage, but that's an individual um, AHJ ruling, and if uh, when in doubt, you always need to use a number six. And then once you get to your junction box or your combiner box you, and you're running conduit the rest of the way to your disconnects and onto your inverter, you transition to um, insulated wire rated at 250.122. It's, it's likely to be a lot smaller um, than the number six. Okay, so common grounding issues that um, we see out there um, in the field is um, there's still a belief sometimes that because you've got metal touching metal that you've got the uh, the module frames um, you know touching the the racking system and you've got your clips you've got your mid clamps and end clips connecting it to that it's properly grounded well that's not true and uh, you know there are some racking systems out there now that are coming out, and they do they are they have been rated as uh, a grounding means, and they've gotten that approved by u l If that's the case, you're in good shape here, but a lot of times that's not the case still, and I think we're going to see a big trend in the in the industry to go towards these racking systems that you know are giving that proper grounding. Um, with all their um, their bolts, you know, going in and and actually, you know, cutting into surfaces so that um, you you make a good bond. But um, unless the manufacturer specifically says that that's the case, you need to make sure that you're using weave clips. You need to make sure you're using, you know, the uh, land lugs. 
um, discontinuous EGC situations are seen out there all the time where the wire is broken. Um, you have to have a continuously running ground all the way through the system. I mean, there's ways to, if you have a, a short wire and you need to, um, you know, add to that wire, there are ways to do that. Um, but you can't just break it and um, go into bus bars or um, things like that. Um, it needs to be run continuously. Um, you can use um, CAD plated, um, some, using CAD plated tech screws to fasten wires or lugs to modules is also not allowed. Um, you've got to make sure that you know, you're making good connections that are going to last. Uh, tech screws could come out easily. They can, you know, lose their bonding quality over time. Um, you need to be, be using bolts and star washers and nuts um, whenever you're attaching your uh, lugs to the modules. Um, you have to make sure that the, the lugs are rated for the environment and, and also for um, um, the racking that you're using. Um, so that you don't have dissimilar metals um, touching each other and causing um, the corrosion and the galvanic action. You also have to make sure allowing the EGC to come in contact with aluminum rails and module frames is what um, this is talking about. And um, you may have to make sure that there's no bonding of aluminum structural parts to steel in ground-mounted systems. Um, basically, um, Corrosion is a, a big issue. Okay, so there's another uh, comment from Sam. How good are weebs? I am always paranoid about them. Are weebs UL and code accepted? Um, it really depends on where you are. If I mean, they they basically, uh, you know, weebs have been tested. Um, a lot, and um, you know they are very, very good to use. I used to be leery about them also because they seem so flimsy. You know how can these work? But they really do dig in, and they really do make a good bond. Um, so a lot of jurisdictions have accepted them now. There are some out there that still haven't accepted them. Um, so you have to make sure what your code officials will allow. Um, the other thing about weaves that you always have to be careful about is that if you if you take a module up, you have to make sure you replace that weeb because um, it's not good anymore. So, you know, there are issues about them, and I'm, I'm really glad to see, you know, um, Unirack, for instance, has just come out with their evolution um, racking system, which is bonding, um, you know, the module frames, you know, to the racking system without having to use weebs, and so, you know, it's, it's a great thing to see. I think that the industry is dealing with this issue as time goes on. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, Sam, um, if you want to, you know, basically, is there anything else you want to say about this? Let me unmute you. Sam, are you there? Hello. All right, well, I'm not hearing you, so um, I guess we'll move on. If you do want to talk, um, just chat in again, and um, I can try to unmute you. Um, and then uh, Max, um, has, is there a code reference for using number six for EGC? I have never heard of this requirement. Um, what, there is a quote code um, section, and it relates to what is considered a it ha you have to use um, what is considered a protected wire, and the code reference. And I and I don't know it off the top of my head. Maybe um, somebody else knows what this is, um, and I certainly can um, look it up and let you know what that is after this. We can do some email or a phone call, um, but. Uh, um, what um, I know about it is that it states that the smallest size wire that you can use, solid, that you can use unprotected is a number six, and that's what the code reference says. So since we're on a roof or since we're on, you know, if we're on a ground mount system and we want to run the bare copper without running it in conduit, 
we have to use a number six. And, um, okay, so um, this was just a comment from Clayton that says, uh, maybe, maybe um, Richard, you address this, but I see all panelists and not all attendees. All right, so moving on, this is a lovely picture. Somebody's used uh, an inside rated lug um, outside. And you can see what happens. It just, it's an amazing short period of time that the lugs start looking like this. So you have to make sure that uh, you use the proper outside rated lugs. Okay. All right, moving along here. Okay, so um, all right, this is something else. Dissimilar metals, the galvanic act reaction and corrosion that takes place. Um, this it really can eat things up. And this was a a, a good picture that was in Solar Pro magazine, um, showing what happens when dissimilar metals touch over a period of time. So what's going on here? Okay, is this properly grounded? Um, and of course the answer is no. What is wrong here? Uh, you know, I see a couple of things going on. It looks like some tech screws were, were used here. Um, um, you basically have to have continuous ground. Um, that's required. You have to be able to, um, if you're going to take a module up, you have to be able to leave a jumper in place, um, you know, so that um, the ground will, will continue on. So you'd have to do some rigging here to make this work. And look at the wire. Does that look like the proper size and the, the proper kind of wire to be used? I mean, it might be the right size according to 250.122, but it's exposed to um, it's not the right kind of wire to be put outside. Um, and it's it's the kind of wire that you put in conduit. So um, beware of that. And you have to have the properly rated lugs and wire. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the grounding electrode system. So if whenever you have um, uh, separate grounding electrodes for AC and DC, they have to be bonded together. Um, and they, when, if you have those, those two ground, uh, grounding electrodes, you have to have them at, um, so that they're not less than six feet apart. And that's in 250.53.3b. Um, and also um, in there it talks about the different kinds of, um, in 250.53.3c, it talks about the different kinds of requirements for bonding jumpers. Um, and that, you know, that a bonding jumper is the conductor that you use to connect the grounding electrodes. And um, also there's requirements, again, for this wire to be continuous. All right, so in 690.47C3, um, it basically talks about how we can actually take the DC grounding electrode um, watt conductor and you can run it into your AC panel or, or uh, load center and you can put it into a bus bar there, the grounding bus bar. That, that is allowed. Um, again, that wire has to be continuously and um, it, if, you are, if you are going to um, um, need to add extra wire onto this wire, you can use what's called an irreversible crimp or an exothermic weld can be used um, to put the wires together. Um, so anyway, so there are ways to do it, but uh, you have to make sure that it's, it's the proper irreversible crimp is the easiest way to do it. Um, and um, um, this section 310.106C also states that conductors larger than number 10 um, bear 
conductors larger than number 10 are not allowed in conduit. And it also says in 250.166 that the minimum size of D, of, uh, D for DC grounding electrode uh, conductor is number 8 copper. All right. Well, number 8 has to be protected and has to be in conduit. So typically what we see, like in residences, we'll see number 6 solid used for the grounding electrode system, um, grounding electrode conductor, or we'll see the wire, the size wire that is rated to the uh, actual main service of the building being used as the grounding electrode conductor and have use the same wire that the building uses, the building system uses. Why is number six allowed unprotected? Um, well, it, you know, that's the code has decided that that's, what it is. Um, it is thicker. It's it's got a, a bigger diameter than than number eight, which is smaller. Um, so you know it would be fairly hard um, to uh, break, or for you know like you said, like a rodent to chew on it. Anyway, so yeah. Anyway, so we're just basically it's a code rule, I know. Okay, so here's an example of something somebody did out in the field. Um, they put, this is a number, these are two number six wires that are being brought together here. Um, you know, like for instance, like when you're running from your inverter over to your ground rod, all right, there's, a, say there's one building, um, you know, grounding electrode, which is like associated like, let me say, right underneath the breaker panel, and you've got, a number six wire coming up from that electrode into your main service uh, panel there. Well, what you can do is you can run from the inverter with another number six and you can attach right to that wire. You either could go down and dig down and get down to the clamp and put another clamp on top of that grounding electrode conductor, um, uh, uh, grounding electrode, um, and attach to the separate clamp or you can use an irreversible crimp, not one of these uh, split bolts, um, and which is actually a crimp that slides over the wire, and then you take, um, you know, a, uh, uh, a tool and crimp it, a big crimping tool, and actually crimp it right around the wire so that um, it's joined and it cannot be removed easily without cutting the wire. Um, so one of these lugs is not permitted. So you know, basically don't use them. OK, so um, additional electrodes for an array grounding. OK, so it's been pretty common for if you can have a pole mount system you know, separate out, out away from the main service, maybe out away from your inverter as well, um, that we would run an additional ground um, rod or grounding electrode into the ground and, and ground in electrode conductor would actually be right there. Um, this is no longer mandated. It does not have to be done, although, um, you know, my personal opinion of this is is that, you know, extra grounds never hurt. Um, it's always good to have extra grounds. And so, um, so there's another question coming in. Um, and so, um, anyway, you might still want to do it, but it's no longer mandated. You just need to know that. Okay, so... Again, question from Craig Murphy. What table or code section is this, the number six sizing? Um, it's in, let me go back, because I actually think I said this in here. Okay, so um, you're talking about this, so using number six, oh yeah, this is the same question that was asked before. Um, I'm going to have to look up the exact section of the code where it says that number six um, is the smallest size wire that's protected, 
And um, if you, basically what I'll do is I'll post that, um, you know, through the system because I don't want to take the time right now to actually go and grab the, the code section. Okay, so Richard looked it up. Okay, it's 250.120C. All the grounding, basically a lot of the grounding stuff that you're going to find out there in the code book is in Article 250. This is the article that you want to, to look at. It's where the tables, the sizing tables, the 250.122 where you size um, the electrode, uh, not the electrode, but the equipment grounding conductor is there. And then 250.166 is the table that you use to size your equipment grounding um, electrode conductor. And um, does everybody understand the difference between the two? Um, if anybody has any, you know, questions about this, please ask, you know, again, you know, what the difference between um, an equipment grounding conductor and an electrode conductor, a grounding electrode conductor. Does everybody understand that? It's a very, very important distinction between the two. You know, where one, the, the uh, um, equipment grounding conductor is bonding all the metal parts throughout the system all together, and um, the equipment, the grounding electrode conductor is actually um, a wire that's attached to an electrode um, that is a grounding electrode for the whole building system, for the whole building wiring system. And you're, you're, we have separate, um, we are doing a separately derived system. Our solar panels are a separate, separate power source. And so what we're doing is we want to attach and ground our PV system to the grounding electrode of the building. So um, anyway, I hope that uh, clarifies that. Okay, so here are some systems out there that, uh, um, okay, so we need a little more. All right. Um, so explaining from point to point. So start, let's start with um, your um, equipment grounding conductor. Okay, you start at your module frames and you bond those module frames to the rails, the racking system. And then from your racking system, you keep running that equipment grounding conductor, you know, to your junction box or your combiner box in the system, um, or m multiple if you have more than one. Um, and then you run your, your grounds from each one of those boxes, um, and you'll at that point change over to running it through conduit, and run it down um, to your disconnect um, through the conduit. And then you will go into your, you'll actually, you know, bond it right into the disconnect um, because you have to, you have to, you know, bond it there. All metal boxes have to be bonded. And so you'll bond it there, then you'll run, keep running it and you'll run it into your inverter and, and, and take it all the way to the, your inverter. Okay, that's your DC side. Then you're going to come out of your inverter and you're going to keep going with this wire and you're going to, you're going to run it all the way, you know, into your AC disconnect. Um, and, and then into the main um, service panel where it lands on the grounding bus bar, you know, in that panel. That's your equipment ground, grounding conductor. Um, so then your, your electrode conductor will go from your inverter and, uh, uh, and run uh, down outside of the inverter and attach either to the wire coming up from a from a, a, a electrode, a grounding electrode for the building. You sometimes might have a separate ground rod that's driven if, if there's some distance um, between the inverter and where the main service is. You would then drive a ground rod or have an electrode that would be right there by the inverter. Um, and then you would run a wire from that electrode, you know, into the inverter and then over to the um, grounding electrode that's part of the system, building system ground. 
Um, and uh, so, anyway, that's that's the way that's done. I hope that explains it more. So, you know, here's some nice-looking systems. And um, you see how the – whoops, let me go back up to that one. See how the the conduit is run up the, off the roof and, you know, how the uh, actual the, – the combiner boxes are up off the roof as well and mounted. Parking structure. So NEC code, it's the minimum. And so, you know, the, a good installer will go above what the code requires. You always want to have the best possible quality system that you can do. So now I want to take a little bit of uh, time here since I have all of your attention and talk about Ontility a little bit, just for, uh, briefly. And then I, I definitely want more questions. We still have about 10 minutes left, so I'm hoping that some of you will have more questions. Um, anyway, we have a, a series of classes ongoing all the time, and um, um, you know you, you're doing this particular workshop, which is really great. Um, and um, but it's still recommended that all of you get face to face and have an in-person study session before the exam, if you can do that. Some of you may already know about this. Um, uh, we basically have a class that's coming up in New Orleans this week that you still that's still room in that class and and you could have a chance to get into it. You'd have to move fast because it starts on Thursday. Um, so uh, there's that option. There's also a class in St. Louis um, going on this week, um, and so those are two classes that um, um, you know are available. There are classes that are going on in uh, Philadelphia as well, but I, I believe you know, there may be room in the one that starts um, tomorrow, which is a little short notice, um, and, but the class that's happening later in the week, Thursday and Friday, is already full, so that one's not an option. And so the other thing that um, I want to talk about is that we have a whole um, package, and some of you, you know, may pass the exam this time, um, and you won't need to have any additional classes related, you know, to preparing for the exam. But we have a whole package of classes, um, uh, you know, that are bundled together for people that, you know, so if you have new people in your company that, that need to get all of the training, um, you know, it starts with um, an entry-level class, um, and then you can pass the uh, entry-level exam. That will give you 18 hours you know, towards your NAPSEP um, test to be able to enroll in the NAPSEP test, then you can go on and we offer a, uh, an advanced class. Let's see if this next slide, yeah, talks about it. We have um, an advanced class that um, we do that's called, it's actually this slide doesn't talk about it, but it's called, you know, AS300 uh, or 310, uh, yeah, 300. And that one you can see on this chart is starting March 26th through 30th, but we're going to run them every couple of months. Um, and that's an advanced 40-hour class. Um, and the new NAPSIP requirements are requiring people, you know, if, if you have people in your company that haven't already signed up for this test or if you haven't signed up for it yet, you're going to have to go by the new rules, which requires that um, you have 58 hours of education and that you have – uh, 40 of those hours have to be advanced training. Um, this class um, takes care of that um, requirement. So that's something to know about. And then also we have an advanced, um, um, it's called 310, AS310, which is an advanced design class. Um, and that one um, also would, would re, you know, be qualified as advanced training. Um, and for those of you that um, aren't going to be taking the test this time or if for some reason you don't make it um, and, and uh, don't uh, pass the exam, then we have a series of classes that's kind of similar to what you're going on uh, doing here, which is called the AS200, and it's going to be a four-month guided study class Webinars every two weeks. You'll be assigned to a particular instructor. Um, Eddie Haynes 
Brian Cunningham or Tim Coates, and you'll have the access to uh, talk to them individually on the phone or in emails in between the webinars. Um, and we help you come up with a study package to really get you through studying for the exam over a period of time and then follow it up with the AS200, 210, excuse me, AS210, which is um, the first one, will, again, will begin on August 23rd. And then we have uh, some uh, other services that we offer for our, our dealers, um, utility being a wholesale distribution company that we sell solar products, but we, we do a lot of uh, support and consulting services. We do design services, but we also um, will help you in whatever way you need, really. We can give you company support to help you grow your business. We can give you project support uh, related to a specific project. Um, we can come out and uh, supervise on the site. We can help manage that project for you on site if need be. We can do third-party commissioning, you know, where if you have uh, an investor or an owner that needs that third-party commissioning, we can offer that. And then for large companies, we can actually do on-site training where, you know, it's a lot cheaper to actually for us to come to you and, and train lots of people in your company at a time. Um, you know, that's, you know, anywhere from 7, 10 or more, um, that's an option as well. So that's it. Well, that's the sales pitch for tonight. Thanks all for attending. Um, does anybody have any more questions? Does anybody have any comments? Do you want to be unmuted so you can, um, we can discuss something? Okay, Max. Um, he made a comment, 690.50 actually refers you to 250.120C. Okay. Good comment. Yeah, the code does that a whole lot. Um, you'll notice that where you're, you read a certain section. And, you know, the other thing about the code book that is, that is really interesting is it's uh, chapters 1 through 4 are basically all general installation knowledge. And then, um, you know, 690 is specific to PV, all right? And wherever anything you find in 690, it's going to override what you have in the first four chapters. Um, and very often, though, if, if it wants you to follow one of the other four chapters, um, it will refer you back to that section. Um, so, you know, a lot of this is getting to know how to read the code book, how to understand how it's organized. So, um, you know, spend some time with that. Um, also, you know, an, another thing that is really important to, to pay attention to is that you have different sections referring to different types of buildings or different types of conditions like hazardous conditions and uh, you have specific conduit requirements that are to be used in hazardous conditions, specific wire that has to be used in hazardous conditions and so it's important to know where those sections of the code book are um, you know, when you're going through the test because a test question might refer you to a specific kind of site. Um, and you'll have to know how to go there and, and make sure that you're using the right type of conduit and wire for the situation, the, type, the right type of fittings, et cetera. Anything else? Well, we'll give it a couple of more minutes, see if anybody has any more questions. We really only have about one minute, so we, you know, we're here. Um, is there a table for sizing um, grounding electroconductors? Yes, it's 250.122, and it's not based off 250.166. That's separate for um, a, that's a. Oh, no, wait a minute. Grounding electrode conductors is 250.166. And there is a table there. That is a table. Um, I was not understanding the question at first. There's equipment grounding conductors. Those are sized based off of table 250.122. And for grounding electrode conductors, you use 250.166. Okay. 
And another question. Um, oh, and thank and and Sam said thank you, Janet. You're welcome, Sam. Um, Andrew, um, does this web session count against the 58-hour requirement for the installer's exam? Um, that's a really good question, and um, it it very well could actually because. Um, Really, everything that Ontility does, all of our classes um, are approved by NAPSEP. And since I'm the instructor, I'm an ISBQ um, in, uh, master uh, in trainer. So therefore, um, anything that I teach um, is qualified. Um, and so if you have interest in that, um, please email me, and we can um, see about getting you a certificate for this hour. And Richard says, um, 250.66 for the GEC for AC, 250.166 is part 8 is for direct current. Yeah, good point, Richard. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, it's been a pleasure. Feel free to email me or call me at any time, um, you know, with questions, more questions if you have them, and really good luck on this test for those of you who are taking it. And I'm signing off. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. We really appreciate it. Uh, we will have the recording of this session up, we hope, tonight. And if not, by uh, tonight's newsletter, we'll have it up for uh, tomorrow. You can see uh, Kathy Redson here. Hello. Hi there. Hey, hey, Kathy. How are you? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that was fun. Thanks for giving me a chance to do that. Oh, hey, yeah. great. Thanks, awesome. for, thanks for doing it. Really great job. So, Thank you. I'll go ahead and... Um, uh, Sign off and capture this recording. And uh, all right, you guys and, have a good uh, night. We should do it again. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we should. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs>